Wildflowers of the Asphalt by William Dean Howells. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Wildflowers of the Asphalt by William Dean Howells. Looking through Mrs. Caroline A. Creevey's charming book on the flowers of field, hill, and swamp the other day, I was very forcibly reminded of the number of these pretty, wilding growths, which I had been finding all the season long among the streets of asphalt and the sidewalks of artificial stone in this city, and I am quite sure that anyone who has been kept in New York, as I have been this year, beyond the natural time of going into the country, can have as real a pleasure in the sylvan invasion as mine, if he will but give himself up to a sense of it. Part One. Of course, it is altogether too late now to look for any of the early spring flowers, but I can recall the exquisite effect of the tender blue hepatica fringing the center rail of the grip cars all up and down Broadway, and apparently springing from the hollow beneath where the cable ran with such a brook-like gurgle that any damp living plant must find itself a home there. The water pimpernel may now be seen, by any sympathetic eye, blowing delicately along the track, in the breeze of the passing cabs, and elastically lifting itself from the rush of the cars. The reader can easily verify it by the picture in Mrs. Creevey's book. He knows it by its other name of brookweed, and he will have my delight, I am sure, in the cardinal flower, which will be with us in August. It is a shy flower, loving the more sequestered nooks, and may be sought along the shady stretches of Third Avenue, where the elevated road overhead forms a shelter as of interlacing boughs. The arrowhead likes such swampy expanses as the converging surface roads form at Dead Man's Curve and the corners of 23rd Street. This is in flower now, and will be till September. And St. John's Wort, which some call the false goldenrod, is already here. You may find it in any moist low ground, but the gutters of Wall Street, or even the banks of the Stock Exchange, are not too dry for it. The real goldenrod is not much in evidence with us, for it comes only when summer is on the wane. The other night, however, on the promenade of the Madison Square roof garden, I was delighted to see it growing all over the oblong dome of the auditorium, in response to the cry of a homesick cricket which found itself in exile there at the base of a potted evergreen. This lonely insect had no sooner sounded its winter boding note than the fawn flower began sympathetically to wave and droop along those tarry slopes, as I had seen it on how many hillside pastures. But this may have been only a transitory response to the cricket, and I cannot promise the visitor to the roof garden that he will find goldenrod there every night. I believe there is always golden seal, but it is the kind that comes in bottles and not in the gloom of deep, cool, moist woods, where Mrs. Creevey describes it as growing, along with other wildings of such sweet names or quaint as celandine and dwarf larkspur and squirrel corn and Dutchman's breeches and pearlwort and wood sorrel and bishop's cap and wintergreen and Indian pipe and snowberry and adder's tongue and wake robin, and dragon root, and Adam and Eve, and twenty more, which must have got their names from some fairy of genius. I should say it was a female fairy of genius who called them so, and that she had her own sex among mortals in mind when she invented their nomenclature, and was thinking of little girls, and slim pretty maids, and happy young wives. The author tells how they all look, with a fine sense of their charm in her words, but one would know how they looked from their names, and when you call them over 
they at once transplant themselves to the depths of the dells between our skyscrapers and find a brief sojourn in the cavernous excavations whence other skyscrapers are to rise part two that night on the roof garden when the cricket's cry flowered the dome with goldenrod the tall stems of rye growing among the orchestra sloped all one way at times just like the bows of violins in the half-dollar gale that always blows over the city at that height but as one turns the leaves of mrs creevy's magic book perhaps one ought to say turns its petals the forests and the fields come and make themselves at home in the city everywhere by virtue of it i have been more in the country in a half hour than if i had lived all june there when i lift my eyes from its pictures or its letterpress my vision prints the idolins of wild flowers everywhere as it prints the image of the sun against the air after dwelling on his brightness the rose mallow flaunts along fifth avenue and the golden threads of the daughter embroider the house fronts on the principal cross streets and i might think at times that it was all mere fancy it has so much the quality of a pleasing illusion yet mrs creevy's book is not one to lend itself to such a deceit by any of the ordinary arts it is rather matter-of-fact in form and manner and largely owes what magic it has to the inherent charm of its subject one feels this in merely glancing at the index and reading such titles of chapters as wet meadows and low grounds dry fields waste places waysides hills and rocky woods open woods and deep cool moist woods each a poem in itself lyric or pastoral and of a surpassing opulence of suggestion the spring and summer months pass in stately procession through the book each with her fillet inscribed with the names of her characteristic flowers or blossoms and brightened with the blooms themselves they are plucked from where nature bade them grow in the wild places or their own wayward wills led them astray a singularly fascinating chapter is that called escaped from gardens in which some of these pretty runagates are catalogued i supposed in my liberal ignorance that the bouncing bet was the only one of these but i have learned that the pansy and the sweet violet love to gad and that the caraway the snapdragon the prince's feather the summer savory the star of bethlehem the day lily and the tiger lily and even the sluggish stone crop are of the vagrant fragrant company one is not surprised to meet the tiger lily and that must always have had the jungle in its heart but that the baby's breath should be found wandering by the roadsides from massachusetts and virginia to ohio gives one a tender pang as for a lost child perhaps the poor human tramps who sleep in barns and feed at back doors along those dusty ways are mindful of the baby's breath and keep a kindly eye out for the little truant part three as i was writing those homely names i felt again how fit and lovely they were how much more fit and lovely than the scientific names of the flowers mrs creevy will make a botanist of you if you will let her and i fancy a very good botanist though i cannot speak from experience but she will make a poet of you in spite of yourself as i very well know and she will do this simply by giving you first the familiar name of the flowers she loves to write of i am not saying that the day-lily would not smell as sweet by her title of hemerocallus folva or that the homely hearty bouncing bet would not kiss as deliciously in her scholar's cap and gown of saponaria officinalis but merely that their college degrees do not lend themselves so willingly to verse or even melodious prose which is what the poet is often after nowadays so i like best to hail the flowers by the names that the fairies gave them and the children know them by 
especially when my longing for them makes them grow here in the city streets. I have a fancy that they would all vanish away if I saluted them in botanical terms. As long as I talk of cattail rushes, the homeless grimalkins of the areas and the back fences help me to a vision of the swamps thickly studded with their stiff spears. But if I call them Typha latifolia, or even Typha angustifolia, there is not the hardiest and fiercest prowler of the roof and the fire escape, but would fly to the sound of my voice and leave me forlorn amid the withered foliage of my dream. The street sparrows, pestiferous and persistent as they are, would forsake my sylvan pageant if I spoke of the bird-foot violet as the viola pedata, and the commonest cur would run howling if he heard the gentle poison dogwood maligned as the rus veninata. The very milk cans would turn to their native pumps in disgust from my attempt to invoke our simple American cowslip as the dodecathion media. Part 4 Yet I do not deny that such scientific nomenclature has its uses, and I should be far from undervaluing the side of Mrs. Creevey's book. In fact, I secretly respect it the more for its botanical lore, and if ever I get into the woods or fields again, I mean to go up to some of the humblest flowers, such as I can feel myself on easy terms with, and tell them what they are in Latin. I think it will surprise them, and I dare say they will some of them like it, and will want their initials inscribed on their leaves, like those signatures which the medicinal plants bear, or are supposed to bear. But as long as I am engaged in their culture, amid the stone and iron and asphalt, I find it best to invite their presence by their familiar names, and I hope they will not think them too familiar. I should like to get them all naturalized here, so that the thousands of poor city children, who never saw them growing in their native places, might have some notion of how bountifully the world is equipped with beauty, and how it is governed by many laws which are not enforced by policemen. I think that would interest them very much, and I shall not mind their plucking my barmecide blossoms and carrying them home by the armfuls. When goodwill costs nothing, we ought to practice it, even with the tramps, and these are very welcome, in their wanderings over the city paved, to rest their weary limbs in any of my pleached bowers they come to. End of Wildflowers of the Asphalt by William Dean Howells